Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of his word. So let's listen in. Here we go. It is a privilege to serve with you guys. And I thought since we're talking about service, talking about giving of ourselves, that we would unpack the real number one true deep reason that every one of us really volunteer or serve the Lord. There's got to be one reason, one motivator beneath everything else that really truly helps us to go the distance when it comes to serving the Lord. Now, I know some of you probably have helped out in various ways, whether it's this church or other places, simply because they needed help and there was nobody else. And so, well, okay, I'll do it, right? That happens. And you find it that you kind of, I like this. This is pretty cool. But really, if you don't have a deep motivator that really is, is foundational to your service, what happens is it becomes a job. And it's something like, oh, no, I got to go again. Or maybe you started helping out because you've got the skill for the job, right? You've got the talent, you've got the know-how, and you know how to do it. You know, I know how to do sound. I'm a good, yip, yip, yip. I can just, you know, I know how to break it down. And so I'm good in that area. And, or maybe you've got the looks for a greeter, you know, hey, welcome to church this morning. Yeah, here's a bulletin. You know, maybe that's what you got. Or maybe you're a good teacher and you can facilitate a good life. Maybe it's the talent, but really... After a while, just the skill will not be motivator enough for you to, to do it with such passion because it'll end up becoming a job. Or maybe it's because somebody said, I know the right person for the job, and they called you up. Hey, you know what? I think you'd be great at the job. Okay, it's yours. You know, maybe you got voluntold. That's a word that's been around this church for a while, voluntold. They, oh, you're the one doing it. Well, how did I get? Well, because we were all together, and you weren't here, and we decided you'd be the best person for the job. <laughs> So go do it. Maybe that's why. And you know what? Those are great motivators. Those are great incentives to serve. But really, I think there is one that holds the most value deep within service. And I want us to unpack that. And we're going to go in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament in chapter 24 to look at this. And so we're going to look at a story in Joshua chapter 24 to really unpack what is a deep, true, meaningful motivator to serve the Lord. What is it? You're on to something back there. But I'm the one preaching, okay? So I'm kidding. No. <laughs> he said grace. He said grace. He's on to something. I think you've read this before. The Bible, I think you're on to something here. So we're going to look in Joshua 24 to unpack what really is at the root or what should be the root of us serving the Lord. A little background to Joshua 24 before we start reading. Joshua is a leader for God's people, the, the Israelites. But I'm going to back up a little bit more to the story. We have Abraham, who was promised to be the father of many nations. And then soon, God's people would have this amazing place that they would get to live and thrive as people. You fast forward a little bit more from that, and what ends up happening is God's people end up slaves. They end up shackled with chains, and they have, oh, we home. Ooh, right? They're working for another guy, for the man and for Pharaoh, and that's not what they want. For hundreds of years, they find themselves enslaved, and God hears the cry of his people, and he says, no, -uh, no more. I'm going to send Moses, and Moses is going to lead my people to the promised land from Pharaoh. And so they, 10 plagues later, and they're off in the desert to wander for a very, very long time. And then they're getting there. Joshua takes over. Moses is no longer their leader. And Joshua helps them cross the Jordan River. And they wade in the water. Have you guys ever heard that song? Anyway, they cross through the Jordan River. They get to the other side and woohoo! Party time! It's the promised land. And so they're there. And it's like, whoa, yeah. And they defeat all these people because God has promised them this land. And so there they are. They're in this place. And Joshua is their leader. Joshua brought them into the promised land. Now they're living in this place promised to them. And here in chapter 24 of Joshua, we find this is the end of the road for Joshua. He's an old man. He's getting ready to die. And I want you to picture kind of like the dad at the end of his days and he's reaching out for his son. He's on his, you know, he's on, it's kind of like the, 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 the speech at the end of the day. He's laying in bed, you know, son, I have something to tell you and give to you. 
My treasure for you is found in the... Uh, I'm like, no, where is it? You know, but this, Joshua doesn't fade like that, okay? But this is what I want you to... He's at the end, and he's giving this final kind of hoorah to the people, and so he assembles them together, and this is chapter 24 of Joshua, and I'm going to read for you. Here we go. Then Joshua assembled all of the tribes of Israel and Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials of Israel, and they all presented themselves before God. It's a pretty big deal. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. So he's prefacing, guys, this is what God is saying. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river, talking about the Jordan, beyond the river, and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led them through Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt." Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with the chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. Do you remember that? That was the Red Sea where Moses, they were up against it, and there's water, and here come the chariots. And we're like, oh, no, we're going to die. And then Moses, oh, with his big staff, and, and God parted the Red Sea, and they went across dry land, right? And it said, but in verse 7, but they cried out to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. Right? It's a really long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I, God said, gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared the fight against Israel, I sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not let Balaam so he blessed you again and again instead, and I delivered you out of his hand. Once again, God delivering and showing himself as a mighty God. Verse 11, Then you crossed the Jordan, and you weighed in the water, and came to Jericho. Do you guys remember the story of Jericho? The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Termites, the Hittites, the Gerashites. I'm just kidding. I added that one in there. It just felt fitting. Just flew right out of there. Uh, the Hivites and the Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornets ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it, God says, with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Let's pause there for a minute. What is God saying? I made the way. I was the one that helped you defeat all the ites. I was the one that gave you the land that you're living in. The, the grapes that you're eating, you didn't even work for. I have paved the way for you, my people. Why? Because I love you. And I have a plan for you. A plan for you to be my people and I want to be your God and I want to provide for you and I want to be faithful to you so I will go before you and defeat your enemies. I will help you cross the sea into the promised land. God paved the way for his people. You know that God is still paving the way for his people. Those that call on the name of the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, he paves the way. First of all, he paved it through Jesus Christ. He provides the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ for us to know him and to have an eternity in heaven with him. He paved the way. He goes before us. He fights our battles. He is the strong tower that we can run to and that the righteous are safe. You see, God is still in the business of providing for his people, of going ahead of them, of fighting the battles that we cannot and don't have the strength to defeat. He can and he does. He paves the way for you and I. 
What I'm learning from this already is this. Joshua had to remind the Israelites where they came from and what battles God had fought for them and that they had won. You ever look back on your life and go, I can see now that God had his hand in what was going on. You ever done that? In the time, you don't, you don't get it, but you look back and you go, oh my goodness, that was God that was protecting me or that was God providing for me or that was God allowing me to go through this trial, but he was with me and I can see it now. I look back and I go, he was there or he was fighting that battle for me. I can't believe it. I don't even think I had professed him as Lord and Savior yet, but I can see how his hand was over me because he wanted me to know him. That's the God we serve. He wants you to know him so desperately that he will pave the way. He will be with you from way back then until the promised land to come of heaven. He's with us. And we need to look back and say, look it. Look, this was God. We need to recognize the battles that he fought for us and recognize that he loves us so much that he paves the way first through Jesus Christ for salvation. So we continue on. And Joshua, after giving them the history lesson, after telling them that God is the one who is defeating all these people for you to go to the promised land, then he says this. Verse 14, Now fear the Lord. After all that, Israelite, fear the Lord and serve him with faithfulness. Why add the word faithfulness? Because God was faithful to them. God was faithful every single time. He came through. It wasn't like there was one day they were going up against the termites, and he's like, nope, sorry, this one's not for me. You guys take this one, you know? By the way, termites wasn't really a, I'm just, you know. He was there every single time he showed himself. And when they were going away, they cried out to him, God was there because he loves his people. He's faithful. And so Joshua says, then you serve him faithfully if he's been faithful to you. Fear the Lord, serve him with all faithfulness. And then he says this, throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. There's a call to put off the old and to recognize that the new that God has given them, that they don't need those idols anymore, that God has provided himself, that God, they don't need to worship anything that their forefathers or any of the other tribes around them, all the the ites that have idols, you don't need that. God is all that you need. Joshua's calling them to a true repentance and a true worship of the one true God. And he says this, but, guys, if, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose this day for yourself whom you will serve choose. You've got to decide whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but you've got to choose. I mean, what's it going to be? Is it going to be the God that's rescued you, that's been there with you the whole time, even in the wandering desert? Even at, Remember the Red Sea, guys? Remember that? Are you going to choose to serve that God that's delivered you or the small g gods of the neighboring towns and your, what, your forefathers and What about the capital G God? He's calling to that. And then he says, who are you going to choose? Choose this day. He's drawing a line in the sand and say, who's going to step on this side and say, this is the God that we serve. And then the iconic line that many of us Christian homes have inside of our home. Joshua says this, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Not only does he draw a line in the sand and say, okay, guys, which, choose today who you're going to serve, but he, makes, he separates himself from Israelites and he says, as a man of God, I will choose today. I will serve the Lord. And because I serve the Lord, my household will. See, when we make a decision to serve the Lord, there's a generation behind us that's watching. There's a generation behind us that's learning that when we step forward and say, I will serve the Lord, that they behind say, that's the life that I am to lead. Whether you're a parent or a grandparent, the heritage of service to the Lord speaks for generations and generations. When we draw that line in the sand and we step over and we say, I will choose today to serve the Lord. To serve the Lord, to follow Him, to be obedient to Him, to give our lives to Him, to then serve and give back everything He's generously given us. And Joshua puts a call out to him and says, I know where I stand. 
but what side of the line do you stand? What's the response? The response is this, and the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us out of our, fa- out, our fathers out of Egypt from that land of slavery. They recognized God's the one saving us. So yeah, we want to serve him. And he performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land And then they say this, we too, count us in, we'll serve the Lord because he is our God. Have you come to a point in your life where you recognize that because he is your God, then you will serve him? He is my God. He is our God. And so I will step forward and say, okay, I'll serve him. If not, then maybe today is that day. Maybe today is a day where you recognize He is God. He has gone before me. He's been fighting my battles, and now I want to start living and serving Him. So you'd think that would be a great end of this portion, but here's what happens is Joshua, being the leader he is, probes them a little bit more. He kind of goes, are you sure? Are you sure? Check this out. This is what he says, starting in 19. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. Joshua, come on. Where's the grace? Come on. He's really pushing them. He's really prying them because he knows where they come from. He knows the temptations that are around the corner. He knows the past and he knows the things around them that will easily distract them from serving their God. And so he's putting them to the test. Say, okay, are you going to really step over on this side of the line? He says, if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end for you after he has been good to you. You know what the people said? They said to Joshua, no. Oh, man. Can you imagine that all these people together and Joshua pushes them a little bit more and says, really? Who are you going to serve? Because you can't just go back to those. That's not okay. Our God is the capital G God. You can't just be like, yeah, we're going to serve him today and then go off and do your own thing. It doesn't work that way. You can't straddle the fence. You have to decide. And together, they make this loud declaration, no, we will serve the Lord. Wow. Are there moments in your life where you actually make a declaration like that? Like, no, I will serve. You know, the enemy of our soul, Satan, is is just clamoring for us, for our soul, to distract us, to break us away from everything that God has intended good for us. And we need to stand up against him, and we need to tell him in the face, no, Satan, I serve the Lord. I will not go down that road. Why? Because God is faithful. He's never let me down. An enemy, you're a liar. You don't really want what's best for me. You just don't want what God's best is for me. And we have to remind him and ourselves out loud, no, I serve the Lord. Be vocal. Stand your ground. Live out the decision that you make. So then Joshua says, you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. In other words, you're the testimony for what you've just declared. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, Joshua said, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. If there's something in your life that keeps you bondage to the enemy, get rid of it. Confess. Find somebody who can keep you accountable. Move forward with somebody next to you and say, I don't want this anymore, but I want to serve the Lord faithfully. Throw them out. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. And then he wrote them all down and they made this big monument and it became this this monumental day where service was ignited by salvation. I read all that to say this, that the deep motivator for serving our God is because he first served you. You see, he served his people by providing the way to the promised land. 
He protected them. He provided water in the desert, manna from heaven, and even quail. He gave them a leader to guide them. He gave them um, dry land to cross. He let them go into this promised land that he had promised. And so they recognized that God had been with them. And that's what motivated them to say, I will choose to serve the Lord. See, that's what should be our deep motivator is the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price for you and I to know him. We are saved through Jesus alone, and that's what ignites our service beyond anything else. Because when a gloomy day comes, and I just don't feel like loving my neighbor as myself, or I don't feel like getting up and serving within the church or outside the church, there's many other ways to serve. We have to understand that those are the days where we reach deep inside and we say, no, Jesus saved me. I'm a brand new creation, and I want to go out there and serve because of what he did for me. I've talked to many people who serve the Lord. And when they do it with such passion, they'll tell you, well, I just, I don't have any other choice. Do you know what God has saved me from? Do you know what my past looks like? And now I'm here, I'm redeemed, I'm restored, and I'm healed, and I, I'm, I have no other choice but to serve God. That is the number one motivator as we serve the Lord. Now, this isn't a ploy for you guys to sign up for all these other ministries in the church. It's not coming, okay? I'm not, this isn't like, oh, I feel like I should really volunteer. Well, good, here are some plenty of areas for you to help out. This is not for that. And I hope that you guys volunteer here, great, but there are so many other ways to serve the Lord. There are organizations out there within our own town that are doing amazing ministries. Last night, I had the opportunity to go to the Pregnancy Care Center Gala, where it's an awareness and fundraiser to keep that ministry alive, powerful, and some of you even volunteer. And there's the Gospel Mission, there's Hearts with a Mission, there's Joe's Place, there's organizations that exist to, to help and mentor people in, their, in such crisis times, but you also have a neighbor who needs to know the love of God. You also have people in your own family that the only time you really want to love them is because God loved you first. And so you do it because salvation is the ignition for service. If we accept Christ into our life and he forgives us, we have no other choice but to serve him and choose this day that we serve him. So today is a, is a challenge. Today is an encouragement Today is a reminder of our motivator to serve the Lord. It's because he sent his son not to to be served, but to serve. Jesus Christ came to serve you and me, the lost, to bring redemption, to make us new. I want to read for you Galatians 5, 13 and 14. Paul says this to the church in Galatia, you, my brothers, were called to be free. That's you and me too, you know. We are called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul saw that the fact that Jesus Christ comes in, the grace that's given to us, that that's our motivator. That just because we have free will doesn't mean I'm going to, woohoo, here we go, on a highway to hell. I mean, I'm not going to do anything I want because I can. He's saying, whoa, hold on, guys. Do you realize that your freedom, you have freedom so you can choose Christ, and that freedom should not be wasted away just indulging in whatever you want, but that freedom is just this spark that you need to serve God. And we see it in how you love the people around you. So don't use the freedom that we think we have just to do whatever I feel like, but use that freedom in Christ to love the people around you. May that be a reminder that we are made new, that he died for me, so I'm going to live for him, and I'll choose today to do that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish this morning? Some of you maybe are challenged this morning to remember why you serve the Lord. Remember why maybe you volunteer at this church or anywhere else. And it's because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has died on the cross for your sins. He has offered you new life. He gives you his spirit to guide you every day you call on him. And that 
is our motivator. That is the single thing that allows us to give our life back to God. Maybe today is a reminder, maybe whatever you're serving in whatever areas, you see it as more of a job and a duty and, and it's not fun anymore, but may we reach deep inside and realize that our passion for serving the Lord is rooted in the fact that we are free and forgiven by Jesus Christ. And maybe some of you have never accepted Christ into your life. Maybe you need to make a decision today to say, you know what, I want to follow God. He's calling me. And I want to serve Him. And today, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm going to step over that line confessing that I need God. And I know He's calling me. And I want to serve Him. I want to follow after Him. Because He has a life for me that's, that's just amazing. If that's you, if you want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior today and follow Him, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, just raise your hand and we, I can pray for you. Is there anybody here? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for Joshua and his leadership and just pushing the people a little bit, helping them to realize, are you really going to serve the Lord? And they say, yes, Lord, may we be those people that we recognize that the motivator for serving you is the salvation that we receive. And for those that are here or listening, confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, asking him for forgiveness of sin, and you are saved. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to you anytime, anywhere. Lord, we submit to your lordship, to your leadership. May we love our neighbor. May we serve our communities. May we give of ourselves because you first gave of yourself to us. And we're thankful and we praise you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I dismiss you with a blessing, we can't finish out a party with balloons without some kind of cake. And so as you leave, I have a cupcake for every one of you. If, even if your name is not on the list, this is just a thank you for giving of yourself for being here. And so please help yourself. I don't want to take any home. Um, and so as you leave, this is just a, a way of saying thank you and that God would bless you. That he would keep you. He would smile on you and be gracious to you. May God show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.